Thank you. So I am Martin Organ of Lund University, and I'll be presenting our paper on the distribution of linear biases. More specifically, I will be going through three different examples of what can happen inside block ciphers in terms of linear cryptanalysis. This is joint work with Mohammed Ahmed Abdelrahim, Peter Bielen, and Gregor Leander at DTU. So the outline of my talk is as follows. First, the general setting, which is block ciphers and linear cryptanalysis. And then the problem, as we see it, with the state of art in terms of knowledge about what happens here, um, how block ciphers behave. And then three different examples ranging from toy cipher to real world block cipher proposal. Each of these examples tells us something about uh, block ciphers and linear cryptanalysis that we hope can improve um, our knowledge about this problem. And then finally, I will conclude the talk. So first of all, the general framework that we will be considering here. So we have block ciphers. Um, we just fix the random unknown key and consider the function f. So it's a permutation over n bits. Now we study this function f using linear approximation. So these brackets here are used to denote the canonical inner product, meaning we take the input to the function, the x, and we take a bit string alpha. And then when we multiply this together, well, we simply pick bits from x as specified by alpha, and we add them together and get a new bit. We do the same with the output f of x using a bit mask beta. And then we have this equation saying that alpha times x is equal to beta times f of x. Now, obviously, if this is a half-decent block cipher, this won't happen with probability one, but some probability uh, one half plus an epsilon, and this is the bias of this approximation. And it's useful also to talk about the correlation, which is simply twice the bias. Um, so the general idea is that the designer of the block ciphers want to make sure that all these biases for all these possible alphas and betas are small, while the attacker wants to find some alpha and beta where there is a large bias. And what is small and large, it depends on several things. So I'll just talk about small and large, and um, that should be sufficient for this talk. So a block cipher typically is constructed using a round function, which we apply r times. And what can we then say about linear approximations? Well, we can consider a trail meaning that when we go from alpha on the input to beta on the output, we pass through several intermediate states where we have intermediate bit masks. And for each such possible choice of intermediate bit masks, we say that we have a trail. So there are typically a large number of trails going from alpha to beta. And the correlation of such a trail, we define simply as the, uh, the product of the correlation of the individual round functions. What's nice about this definition of the correlation of trail is that then the correlation of, the correlation of the, an approximation is simply the sum over all trails of the correlations of each trail. Now a block cipher not only typically looks like this, but also like this. So we have linear round key additions in between each of these rounds. And then we update uh, this slide slightly, namely the correlation of a trail is the product, as previously, of the correlations, but we then flip the sign. We choose the sign depending on the particular key that we are using. And then this summation formula is updated accordingly. So we add together all these correlations of the trail, but with change signs depending on the key. And this is usually referred to as the linear hull. So, what about the problem that I talked about? What do we know and what do we not know about how this behaves? So what we can do is we can bound the correlation of a single trail. That's usually very straightforward. We just count the S boxes, basically, or study how much nonlinearity is introduced here at the minimum. What we cannot do is bound the correlation for a linear approximation. That is, when we sum all of these trails together in a key-dependent way, what happens? 
do they cancel out to zero, more or less, or do they somehow magically all get the same sign contribution so it becomes this huge number? Well, we don't really know. Uh, there is clearly a distribution. When we pick a key, we get some bias, but what does this distribution look like? So the first and sort of obvious solution to this is, well, basically ignore the whole problem, just deal with single trails. We find the trail that has the largest correlation, and then when we sum over all the trails, we assume that basically all other trails add up to zero somehow. So we just get basically the contribution from the largest trail. And this might um, work in a sense, but we don't really know if it's correct. Um, we can model the situation somehow, for example, assuming that all of these trails are independent. So this sum of trails is a sum of a, a lot of independent stuff, and that's usually easy to handle. Uh, so we might reach some conclusion there. If we are even more advanced, we might perform simulations to somehow verify those, uh, uh, the result of this modeling. This is usually difficult in a computational sense. Uh, so one studies a smaller state version of the block cipher. And then, of course, the question is, these simulation results, are they at all uh, valid when we consider the actual block cipher with a larger state? So on the, let's say, to-do list of the community is to develop a reasonable framework for studying this. And we claim that it hasn't been done before. Um, it's difficult, sure. And we also think that, well, we didn't really try very hard so far. So then we um, will give the contribution here, which is three different examples of what can happen inside a block cipher in this sense of the correlations. Um, first of all, we will give a counterexample to an earlier result, and then two other examples. And all in all, we believe that this gives an idea of what you can and cannot hope to prove in the situation, and hopefully this will serve as inspiration for future work. So the examples, first of all, the cube cipher, which is just a toy cipher, but it does tell us something interesting. There is a result by Damon and Raymond saying that if we have an n-bit block cipher with independent round keys, uh, a huge number of non-zero trails, and all of those trails have the same absolute correlation, so all of those correlations are just plus or minus some constant. Then, when we pick a key, well, what bias do we get? What distribution is there? And the theorem says that the bias distribution tends to a normal distribution as we increase n. So for a large enough block size, the distribution will look sufficiently much like a, like a normal distribution. Namely, if we plot the bias against the number of keys, most of the keys will provide a bias uh, centered, let's say, around zero, then there will be uh, some keys that give a larger bias in absolute terms, but there will be this uh, normal distribution, which sort of makes sense when we have this summation formula with some, a huge number of uh, variables which have the same uh, absolute value, and we assume the independence in the keys, so it's basically a, an, a sum of independent variables, right? And we get this quotient. So however, let's look at the cube cipher, where each round function is a cubing in a finite field. And there are only two rounds. So this is clearly a toy cipher. There is a lot of structure here. It's subject to uh, various attacks, but it has independent round keys. It has a huge number of non-zero trails, and they all have the same absolute correlation. Uh, so still, while this is a toy cipher, it should behave according to the theorem, but it doesn't. While the theorem suggests this nice bell curve, what we get is this very, let's say, discrete distribution of just five distinct values for the correlation for all values of n. So no matter how much we increase the block size, block size the distribution will look like this, which is not a normal distribution. Um, so there is something wrong in that. A theorem, for sure. Now, the next two examples deal with the key scheduling. That is how you pick your round keys. Um, one common analysis is, well, assume independent round keys, do some modeling, 
for example, getting this uh, Gaussian on the previous slide. Uh, and then you replace your independent round keys with dependent keys coming from some key schedule. And then the question is, how valid is your analysis? Um, I will be presenting two examples of what can happen when you have clearly dependent round keys, but still, not, um, so you replace these independent round keys with dependent round keys. First of all, present, which is a well-known block cipher. If you are familiar with it, it looks like this. If you're not familiar, you don't need to look at this at all. We just note that there are round functions, round keys, the usual stuff, and the distribution is close to normal. So this is um, what the distribution looks like for 17 rounds of present. It's a nice uh, Gaussian, that's good. Now what we do is we replace all of these round keys, which are usually non-linearly related, with a constant round key. And just to get rid of some trivial attacks, we introduce round counters. So we have a constant round key and some round counters. And then what happens to the bias distribution? We get this red curve, which is sort of flatter and wider. That is, it has a larger variance. So in particular, if we study a large bias, so far to the right here, um, while with the original key scheduling, we have virtually no keys yielding this large bias. Now there are, is actually a substantial fraction of keys that has such a large bias, meaning this cipher is less secure. We need more round functions. Um, we need more computations, basically. We get uh, worse efficiency. So clearly here, the key schedule influences the behavior in terms of linear cryptanalysis. The conclusion being that this present with constant round keys is uh, not secure, or not as secure as original present. It's worth noting that the hash function spongent, which is sort of based on present, does not have this S-box, so this does not give any attack or anything on spongent. Indeed, this is the very reason that spongent has another S-box. But more rounds help. With more rounds, we squeeze together this distribution, we, the variance becomes smaller, so everything still works, given sufficiently many rounds. So then for the third example, where the number of rounds will turn out to be, well, it's, it's not a parameter, basically. We will not be able to fix things using more rounds. Um, this is print cipher, and again, if you're not familiar with it, don't look too much at the details. We'll just note that last year at Crypto, Leander and friends presented an invariant subspace attack. Um, this means that we consider a subspace, and, or actually a coset of a subspace, and if the input to the round function is in this coset, then the output of, of the round function will, will also be in this coset. Now this is not affected by round counters or anything, so this holds for all rounds, meaning that if the plain text is in this coset, then so is the ciphertext. And this happens for some keys, which we call weak keys. Now this is clearly bad because it gives a distinguisher. You just try a few plain texts and ciphertexts and then you know if you have this type of key. But let's see, uh, okay, so yeah, this extends to the entire print cipher. Um, so let's see what happens to the distribution of linear biases. So this is a plot of it. We have, well, the bias against the number of keys where we go through all all different keys here. And it looks sort of like a Gaussian, but there is also some small bubble out to the left. Looking closer at this, this is another Gaussian, which is much smaller. And it turns out that these two distinct Gaussians correspond to the weak keys and the non-weak keys. So for the good keys, we have a bias centered at around zero. Everything is working as it should and the way it, works, it matches the uh, independence analysis pretty nicely. But when we have these weak keys, we get another smaller bubble out to the left with a large bias. So this bias is actually large enough to break print cipher in this uh, cryptanalysis sense. So that's clearly not good. Um, we'll try to explain that, and we do that by turning to the correlation matrix. Now this is a concept introduced by 
Damon and friends. So you make this huge matrix where you take all possible alphas and all possible betas. So you derive all possible correlations. And then you put them in a matrix in a structured way. And this is a nice tool to analyze these functions. In particular, it turns out that when you have an invariant subspace like this, then what happens is that in this correlation matrix, there appears an eigenvector with value, eigenvalue one, and a very nice structure of the eigenvector. Um, the eigenvalue one essentially means that we have a non-zero limit of this matrix to the power r, that is applying r rounds of this cipher. So this, this is basically trade, trade clustering. Everything is adding up. The eigenvector is a constant times this plus minus pattern. And this gives the matrix power limit as a constant times a very nice plus minus one pattern. There is really only one way you can pick this constant. And this eigenvector analysis suggests that all these biases, when you increase the number of rounds, will tend to two to the minus 16, plus or minus. And actually, that is what happens for the, for the full print cipher. It turns out that we have these large biases, plus or minus this two to the minus 16, which is way too large for print cipher. Um, so that's pretty bad. But we were also able to show that there is actually an equivalence here. So the, the good thing here is that if you do not have an invariant subspace, which let's say a good uh, pseudo-random function <coughs> shouldn't, then you do not have this kind of trade clustering. Then you do not have this eigenvector with this eigenvalue where everything just adds up to these large biases. Clearly, other things can certainly go wrong. So this is, if you don't have an invariant subspace, it's not a promise that everything is perfectly fine. Um, to conclude this talk, we saw that, well, assessing security against linear cryptanalysis, it's sort of tricky. There's a lot of hand waving. You make a lot of assumptions, derive your conclusions, and then you don't bother about the assumptions anyway. You introduce dependency and so on. And what happens is an open question. At least we managed to show that an old theorem is not entirely correct. Uh, new results or new attempts to describe what happens with the, this distribution need to somehow deal with the cube cipher, either by describing what happens there or by somehow removing the cube cipher from the context of the theorem. It is a toy cipher and it's, in, well, it's not really interesting. So if you exclude it entirely from the theorem, you might be able to say useful things still. Now with identical round keys, um, bad things happen. So one lesson here might be don't use identical round key. So then the question still is how how dependent keys can you use them? What do you need nonlinearity? How much nonlinearity do you need? And so on. And there are, yeah, in short, a lot of things to do still about linear cryptanalysis. Thank you. Thank you very much.